Welcome to the latest edition of The Situation Room, where today our lead story delves into a pressing geopolitical dilemma. Is Venezuela on the brink of invading its neighbor, Guyana? As Venezuelans gear up for a landmark referendum on the creation of Guyana Esquiba, a potential 24th state within Venezuelan borders, the tension with Guyana escalates. This controversial move, seen by many as an illegal annexation, could reshape South American geopolitics and potentially ignite the region's first interstate war in decades. We also turn our attention to the United States and the unveiling of the B-21 Raider, America's next generation stealth bomber. But the real story to that lies in China's response, claiming their hypersonic missiles could counter this technological marvel. This bold assertion, if true, could redefine aerial warfare and challenge the US's strategic dominance. And finally, we update you on the tense political climate in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. With elections looming, fears of corruption, authoritarianism, and escalating violence grow. In a country already ravaged by conflict, the potential for further turmoil could have far-reaching implications, not just for the DRC, but for global powers with vested interests in the region. So, our lead story. Is Venezuela about to invade its neighbor? This Sunday, December the 3rd, Venezuelans are headed to the polls in a much-hyped referendum. Sold on social media with reggaeton remixes and boosted on TV by multi-hour lectures starring President Nicolas Maduro, the referendum will set out a series of five constitutional questions for voters to answer. Most important among them will be one on the creation of a brand new state within Venezuela, Guiana Esquiba. If the referendum succeeds, then the government in Caracas will declare it their nation's 24th state. But this isn't like those occasional referendums the US holds on making Puerto Rico a state. Unlike Washington, Caracas does not control the territory that it's trying to incorporate, nor does almost any other government or institution on Earth think it legally belongs to Venezuela. Rather, El Esquibo, sometimes also called Esquibo, lies entirely within neighboring Guyana's internationally recognized borders. A swath of rainforest that's larger than England or Cuba and accounts for two-thirds of Guyana's overall landmass. It's also home to 300,000 of the country's 800,000 strong population. And while the referendum will ask whether they should be granted automatic Venezuelan citizenship, those living in Esquiba won't be able to vote. In short, it looks a whole lot like Caracas is holding a vote with only one logical outcome, the illegal annexation of a neighboring nation's territory. Certainly, that's how the Guyanese see it. To quote the BBC Spanish language service, BBC Mundo, according to the Guyanese government, the referendum represents an existential threat to the territorial integrity of Guyana. And they're not the only ones to think so. An urgent hearing is currently being held at the International Court of Justice, where American lawyer Paul Reichler recently declared, the collective decision called for here involves nothing less than the annexation of the territory in dispute. This is a textbook example of annexation. Most likely, the world court will agree. Which may be why one of the referendum questions asks Venezuelans if Caracas should reject the court's jurisdiction over the case. To say this is causing anxiety in the tiny Guyanese capital of Georgetown is a little bit like saying that the Game of Thrones finale made some fans mildly upset. Come on, John! President Earth finale recently fired warning shots across Caracas's bow, declaring, let no one make a single mistake. Essequibo is ours every square centimeter. The unspoken fear is that Maduro might use a win in the referendum to send his soldiers sweeping over the border. That we might be on the cusp of South America's first interstate war since Ecuador and Peru skirmished over Sinapa in 1995. We'll come onto the likelihood of that later in today's video, but for now we want to try and quickly answer the question that you're already likely asking, and that's why are they doing this? Why does Caracas want this sparsely populated slice of jungle? And well, that's a question with two basic answers, one practical and one historical. Let's start with the practical one. The Venezuelan government wants Esquiba for the same reason any country usually wants a slice of its neighbor, the natural resources there. The disputed region is home to 300 kilometers of coastline, offshore of which runs almost the entire Stabroek Block, a Massachusetts-sized region that's very rich in oil. Discovered by ExxonMobil in 2015, ownership of the block gives Guyana control of one of the largest proven reserves on Earth. As of late 2023, these reserves are larger than those of Kuwait or the United Arab Emirates, with more oil being discovered all the time. Already, Georgetown is moving to exploit this black gold. Just four short years ago, 
ago, in 2019, petroleum made up a mere 2% of Guyana's GDP. Last year, it was over 60%. And that is just the start. The Economist estimates that Guyana will be producing 1.2 million barrels a day by 2028, equivalent to 1.1% of all oil extracted on the planet. This would put it behind only Brazil and Mexico in terms of Latin American oil producers and far ahead of Venezuela's output of 750,000 barrels a day. Of course, though, it's not the oil itself Georgetown cares about, but the money that will come with it. Oil extraction could add $16 billion annually to the government's pocket by the mid-2030s. For a middle-income nation of under 1 million people, such a sum would be transformative. Speaking to the Washington Post, research professor of Latin American studies Evan Ellis noted, it's hard to overestimate how much that oil means to the future of Guyana. It provides what was once one of the poorest countries in the entire hemisphere on a per capita basis, with the potential to possibly become one of the richest countries in the hemisphere. Nor is it just oil that the waters off the coast of Essequiba are hiding. Enormous supplies of natural gas have also been discovered, with the finance minister recently estimating reserves of 0.48 trillion cubic meters. Inland too, the province is rich in natural resources. Gold is already mined here, and plans are in place for uranium mines to open in the near future. On top of that, BBC Mundo points out that Essequibo is part of Guyana's Massif, the geographical region which has proven a great source of copper, diamond, iron, bauxite, and aluminium. So, yes, pretty easy to see why Caracas might be interested in claiming Ezequiba for itself. But it's not resources that sit at the heart of Venezuela's referendum, or at least not openly. There's also history. Specifically, what Venezuelans of all political stripes think is their historical right to the region. Go to a regular Venezuelan school and open a textbook, and you'll see the country is depicted as having an unusual shape. Instead of stopping at the eastern edge of the states of Bolivar and Delta Amacuro, it continues all the way to the Essequibo River in modern day Guyana. That's the extent of territory Caracas claims it controlled on independence from Spain in 1811, what many Venezuelans consider their nation's natural boundaries. So you might ask, why don't they control all of that land today? Well, for that, you can thank a long-running dispute with the British Empire. In 1814, what we call today Guyana was handed from the Dutch to the British as a result of a treaty. Importantly, that treaty didn't specify the colony's western boundary with Venezuela. In 1835, the British tasked German explorer Robert Schambock with defining the frontier. The region he mapped out included the whole of Essequiba, just as it became apparent that gold was lurking there. Obviously, Venezuela wasn't cool with a bunch of limeys declaring the gold-rich region their property, and a dispute broke out. At first, the two nations agreed to leave Essequiba uninhabited, but by the second half of the 19th century, English speakers were openly setting up shop there. Things came to a head when America, under President Grover Cleveland, decided to get involved on Caracas's side. This nearly led to war between the US and Britain, but a fight was averted by the creation of a tribunal that would issue a final ruling on the matter. Composed of two lawyers picked by Venezuela, two picked by the British, and a neutral diplomat diplomat from Russia, the tribunal ruled in 1899 in Britain's favor. Essequiba went to what we now call Guyana. For Georgetown, and for most of the world, this is where the historical background ends, with a ruling 124 years ago that set the legal boundary. But you won't be surprised to hear that's not how Caracas sees things. In the Venezuelan telling, a bombshell revelation in 1949 suggesting the Russian diplomat had conspired with Britain to swing the result, rendered the 1899 ruling void. Hence, one of the questions on the upcoming referendum will ask voters if Caracas should reject the tribunal's decision. Although it should be pointed out that 1899 wasn't the only attempt to solve the dispute. When Guyana achieved independence from Britain in 1966, the new government, along with London and Caracas, signed the Geneva Agreement, binding the two nations to settling the dispute through friendly negotiations. Although talks broke down, the agreement is technically still in place. Maduro claims the referendum is abiding by its rules, but it's hard to see how annexation can be interpreted as friendly. And besides, there is already another process ongoing to settle the boundary. Back in 2018, Guyana asked the World Court to make a final, legally binding ruling on the region. The case was only officially taken up this April, in part due to Venezuelan legal shenanigans, and no verdict is expected for several years. Nonetheless, it's a process recognized by nearly every nation on Earth. By jumping the gun with Sunday's referendum, Maduro risks breaching international law. It's this last part that has led some to suspect President Maduro doesn't really plan to annex Essequibo at all. After years of economic catastrophe, Caracas has finally seen US-imposed sanctions on oil, gas, and gold lifted. Were Maduro to follow through on a referendum victory and send troops to occupy Essequibo, it would result, at bare minimum, in the return of sanctions. This time, 
more countries might comply with them. While many Caribbean states such as Jamaica, Haiti, and Trinidad and Tobago declined to join previous rounds of sanctions on Venezuela, the Caribbean grouping CARICOM has voiced its strict opposition to the referendum and to military action in Essequibo. Any attempt at annexation could invite a swift regional backlash. And that's not including any potential military responses to an incursion. While Guyana's military is small, Vice President Barra Jagdeo has recently started threatening to allow foreign powers to build bases in Essequibo. France 24 reports him as saying, quote, We were never interested in military bases, but we have to protect our national interest. All the options available for us to defend our country will be pursued every option. These options included a November visit by U.S. Defense Department officials, a veiled threat to allow Uncle Sam to establish a base on Venezuela's border if Maduro doesn't back down. Taken together, these factors suggest Maduro would have to be extremely foolish or extremely stupid to annex Essequibo. Hence why a lot of analysts think this entire referendum is just a bit of a show. As part of the agreement to lift US sanctions, the Venezuelan government had to agree to hold elections in 2024. While those elections are unlikely to be fair, public discontent is so high that Maduro could lose even while pressing his thumb down on the scale. Luckily for the Venezuelan president, Essequibo is perhaps the only issue that unites the government and the opposition. As BBC Mundo put it, Analysts anticipate massive support for the Venezuelan government's proposals, which will mobilize its electorate in a country where the Essequibo demand unites Chavistas and opponents like no other issue. With Maduro at the head of the referendum's yes campaign, it looks like December the 3rd may be nothing more than a stunt, an attempt to swing national feeling behind the president ahead of January's election. It's not for nothing that leading opposition candidate Maria Karina Machado recently called for the referendum to be suspended, arguing it was a distraction from the collapsing economy. If that's the case, then it seems likely the referendum will pass in a grandiose display of jingoism and nothing more. The Maduro will follow his victory with fiery speeches and soaring rhetoric, but without ordering his nation's army to the disputed border. As the Economist's intelligence unit describes the situation, although Venezuela has been suggesting that it could take military action to annex a large part of Guyana's land and offshore claims, we believe that its bark is worse than its bite. Certainly, we hope that assessment is proved to be correct, that this really is just a cynical political game by an autocrat facing a tough re-election. But if this decade has taught us anything, it's that the world should always err on the side of caution, especially where war is concerned. After all, only a handful of nations believed in early February of 2022 that Russia would really attack Ukraine. Fewer still thought on September the 18th this year that Azerbaijan was just 24 hours away from a lightning assault on Nagorno-Karabakh. And almost nobody predicted that Ethiopia's government would invade its Tigray province in 2020, triggering what may be the bloodiest conflict this century. Could the world now be making a similar mistake with Venezuela? Guyana's government certainly thinks so. Georgetown recently described the referendum as, quote, a sinister plan by Venezuela to seize Guyanese territory. Nor has Venezuela's government done much to tamp down anxieties. Defense Minister Vladimir Pedrino Lopez recently noted that the dispute with Guyana, quote, is not an armed war for now. So are Guyana's leaders right to be worried? Who knows? The smart money is still on Maduro talking a big game and then taking no action. But who can say for sure? With crises mushrooming up and the international order breaking down, it's clear we've already entered a new era of uncertainty, one in which leaders make irrational decisions at great cost to themselves and to others. We can only hope that President Nicolas Maduro isn't about to join their ranks. And now let's move on to our second story, and that's one about China being a bit freaked out. So, we'll pivot to the United States, where on November the 10th, the world's newest warbird took to the skies for the first time over the U.S. Air Force's Plant 42 in Palmdale, California. Known as the B-21 Raider, the aircraft in question is the latest evolution of U.S. strategic bomber technology. It's capable of delivering immense weapon loads at long range, it uses a stealthy flying wing design, and it's capable of delivering nuclear weapons against just about any target across the world. Although the plane, designed and built by Northrop Grumman, has been a carefully guarded secret for the US for some time, its inaugural flight was witnessed by a handful of aviation enthusiasts who had hoped to see it take off. While no video exists yet of the Raider in the air, photos and witness accounts indicate that the test flight was a resounding success. The Air Force expects to purchase a minimum of 100 Raiders by the time all is said and done at a sum per plane of over half a billion dollars. When it begins its service life, it'll start phasing out older B-1B Lancer and B-2 Spirit bombers in a move expected to keep America on the cutting edge of strategic bombing for decades to come. 
But all that is actually not why we're mentioning the B-21 Raider today. Instead, we're going to focus on the response from the nation widely seen as the US's greatest global adversary in the coming decades, and that of course is China. The rising superpower didn't have too much to say in the immediate aftermath of the test flight, but that changed on November the 27th. On that day, a report by South China Morning Post, a historically reputable Hong Kong-based outlet that in the 2020s is widely regarded as a tool used by China to spread its influence, alleged that the high hypersonic missiles in China's arsenal had the ability to counter the B-21. If true, that would mean that the B-21 would be outmatched in a major war with China, essentially rendering the radar obsolete before it's even gone into production. According to the South China Morning Post, China's hypersonic weapons have the potential to directly counter the B-21. The missiles have a top speed of Mach 6, or six times the speed of sounds, while the top speed of the radar is currently unknown. By the SCMP's report, a stealth platform that mimicked a B-21 was shot down by such a hypersonic missile during a war game. Also shot down was a companion drone assigned to China's Mark B-21, which is a widely expected wingman feature for next-generation US aircraft. As the SCMP presented it, the B-21 stealthy design was a non-issue to quote, China's hypersonic missiles are built with special features to track and kill stealth aircraft. Using a new solid fuel pulse engine that can adjust power output at will throughout the flight, the missile can first go up to near space and then then come down on the enemy aircraft at an extremely high speed. The report referred to this attack vector as a Chiang Zhuzheng trajectory, in homage to the father of modern Chinese rocketry, Xian Huaseng. The SMP stated that in their battle simulator, their hypersonic missiles were able to perform sharp turns after being launched, meaning that they could attack the B-21 from angles that would not generally be expected from a hypersonic weapon. As the scientists who ran the Chinese study claim, the use of multiple hypersonic missiles allowed the weapons to factor in an evasive maneuver by the B-21, which would avoid the first missile launched at it. Then the second missile, which had previously been aimed at the B-21's drone wingman, changed targets and hit the B-21, while the first missile circled back around, eventually taking out the wingman that the second missile had initially locked onto. If that report is true, it would mean that China has achieved something groundbreaking with the hypersonic missile technology. According to journalist Russ Niles of AV Web, hypersonic missiles operating at Mach 6 would typically be unable to communicate externally because of the intense heat generated by air resistance as they fly, much like astronauts undergoing orbital re-entry will have a communications blackout on their descent. According to China, its missile's course correction was enabled because scientists could maintain contact with weapons even at Mach 6, representing a potential game changer not just in hypersonic missile design, but in the way that future wars are expected to be conducted. Already, the relatively high maneuverability of hypersonic missiles at extreme speed makes them very difficult to counter as an offensive weapon against ground targets, but if they can be engineered to react in real time while responding to defensive threats, either using autonomous AI guidance or taking cues from human operators, then it's entirely possible that they would present a threat that the radar isn't designed to deal with. If the radar is indeed outmatched by the hypersonic missiles China has in its arsenal, that would be a major problem for the United States. At present, the B-21 program is estimated to have cost many billions of dollars already, and a full production run would cost many billions more, only for China to be able to nullify the entire radar fleet at the drop of a hat. China is known to have the world's best hypersonic weapon arsenal, and has most likely got the ability to produce missiles much more quickly and cheaply than the US can produce bombers. Adding to the issue for the US, a weapon of this type in China's arsenal would probably lead China to table its own strategic bomber program, as its forthcoming Xi'an H-20 would probably be vulnerable to the same technology and wouldn't be worth building. Not only would this mean that the US has spent a heap of unnecessary money that China would save, but it would undo what has likely been years of intelligence work by the US to figure out just what China's newest bomber is capable of. And worst of all, and probably most obvious, a dependable countermeasure against the radar would leave the US entirely without strategic bomber capability, leaving a gaping hole in its military doctrine and forcing a major rethink of how the US military intends on carrying out its overarching missions. But all that conjecture only matters if you believe China's assertion in the first place, and the United States military might not. The first place to be skeptical is in trying to figure out just what this war game is and how it was set up. 
Obviously, the test that China is referring to was not carried out on a real-world, accurate mock-up of the V-21. If China had revealed that they had one of those lying around, then that would be a much, much bigger issue and probably the greatest intelligence failure in American history. Instead, the war game was carried out via computer simulation. And while the South China Morning Post report was accompanied by an academic study, there's no way to independently verify whether the study accurately reported all of the constraints placed on the war game it conducted, or in fact, whether every simulation was reported, or whether these simulations were actually even conducted at all. Quite frankly, it's easy to omit constraints, like, for example, establishing that the simulated B-21 cannot perform certain evasions, or to make tweaks that would give the simulated hypersonic weapons abilities that aren't yet developed. It's also easy enough to say, run a hundred war games and report only the ones that looked the best, or to just, well, write a study as if you ran a war game and just leave it at that. Beyond that, we've also got to maintain a healthy skepticism about the assertion at the core of China's argument that the B-21 has been designed without countermeasures or other means that would allow it to deal with a hypersonic missile that can change course like the simulated ones did. It is accurate for China to emphasize that, as far as we know in the public domain, a hypersonic weapon with that capability would be a new development. But what we don't know is whether the US, Russia, China, or for that matter any other global power might have already developed such capacities and just kept them secret. Not only that, but there's nothing to stop Northrop Grumman and the US Air Force to plan for the eventuality that someone, somewhere, will figure out how to control hypersonic missiles at top speed, even if that technology doesn't yet exist. Regardless, it's a fairly major assumption to suppose that the radar has no means to counter such a weapon or isn't built in a way that would allow software updates, hardware attachments, or other tools to grant it that ability by the time it begins its service life. At present, we can't say with any level of certainty whether China's claim is legitimate, whether it should be taken seriously, or whether the US military believes that China's hypersonic arsenal is actually a threat to the B-21. What we can say is that China's decision to release this report now is not an accident. With the B-21 now taking to the skies, China was overwhelmingly likely to have some sort of response. But it's telling that this is the response that China chose to assure its partners around the world, its adversaries, and perhaps even itself, that it does have the capacity to deal with the threat posed by the raider, and that it shouldn't be tested in open combat against the People's Liberation Army. Whether that sentiment should be taken as a stone-faced and brutally honest warning by Xi Jinping, or whether it should be taken as a bluff, there's no way to know until or unless Beijing simulations are put to test in real life. And finally, today, we return to the Democratic of the Congo, where a couple of weeks ago, we explained that the DRC is barreling toward an electoral cycle marked by corruption, authoritarianism, and perhaps most worrying of all, violence that has escalated sharply in the last few months. With elections still on track to take place on the 20th of December, just under three weeks from when we're recording, a range of new international observers have warned that the situation there risks spiraling out of control. First of all, a little bit of context. Since it gained independence in the 1960s, the DRC has been marred by practically constant violence, which has escalated or de-escalated many times, but never really fully gone away. It's a resource-rich nation, but one in which the average person is very poor, due in large part to government corruption and resource exploitation by foreign powers. The Congo's current president, Felix Shisekiri, was first elected in 2018, despite widespread concerns around the legitimacy of that vote, and since then, his rule has been marked by the same corruption and the same political repression that Congolese citizens have known for so long. But neither the government's repression nor the Congolese opposition have tended to settle their differences through negotiation. Instead, some six million Congolese have died as a result of war since 1996, in wars where torture, ethnic cleansing, the use of child soldiers, and massacres of civilians are all too common. The UN has maintained a presence in the area until recently, although they and other peacekeeping organizations have now been kicked out of the Congo in advance of the coming election. The Congolese government is actively battling against a range of rebel groups, but most prominently an organization called the March 23rd Movement, or M23. At the same time, it deals with a constant flow of weapons and supplies en route to those rebels, provided directly or indirectly by neighboring Rwanda. In such a fractious situation, both the people of the DRC and interested spectators from around the world have been able to see the writing on the wall for a while now. The 2023 elections, if indeed they happened in 2023 at all, were going to be ugly. As for how ugly they had become, the world found that out on July the 14th of this year, when a prominent opposition leader named Cherubin Okende was found shot dead in his car in the Congolese capital city of Kinshasa. 
Mackenzie was the spokesperson for an opposition party known as Ensemble, whose leaders, Moise Katumbi, was expected to be one of Shisekedi's most dangerous political opponents. That prediction has largely borne out. Katumbi has secured the endorsement of several now former candidates, including a former prime minister and a prominent businessman, Seth Kakuni, who at 41 had previously been the election cycle's youngest candidate. But several other opposition leaders have been arrested in the months since Akende's assassination, with others reporting intimidation from the Congolese government. Political supporters of the opposition have increasingly faced arbitrary arrest, abduction, and severe restrictions on their ability to peacefully assemble. Those who are arrested, regardless of whether they're leaders or supporters of the opposition, have largely been denied due process. Even Katumbi himself has been restricted in his campaign movements and barred from accessing areas of the country that are seen as more favorable electoral territory. With such obvious attempts at electoral manipulation by the regime, pressure is mounting on election organizers to try and avoid the many issues of the Congo's last election. But that pressure campaign misses an important point, that the overreach of the DRC's current governments in advance of this election is already far greater than what the Congo experienced in 2018. Moise Kutumbi and the election's other prominent candidates are fighting an uphill battle, with Shishikidi broadly understood to be the current frontrunner regardless of how he got there. The solution, as many within the Congo's opposition see it, is likely to be consolidation. That is to say, getting all but one of the country's 23 opposition challengers to drop out of the race, throwing their support behind whomever they believe is the single candidate most likely to win in the DRC's difficult electoral environment. That's likely to either be Moise Katumbi, the 2018 electoral runner-up Martin Fayula, or a gynecologist named Dennis Mukwege, who earned the Nobel Peace Prize for his work treating women who were sexually assaulted by militias in the DRC's eastern regions. But despite some progress made at a summit in Pretoria, South Africa, two weeks ago, where five opposition parties chose to throw their support behind Katumbi, his two main competitors still haven't. Now, with less than three weeks remaining, it seems highly unlikely that either Fayulu or Mukwege will drop out, all but guaranteeing a fractious election where Shishikedi will waltz back into office. And we can't emphasize enough just how rare it is that the DRC has a peaceful election at all. So rare, in fact, that the 2018 election that brought Felix Tshishikedi to power has been the only peaceful transfer of power in the Congo's history. Over six decades of independence, and the DRC has done this peacefully exactly one time. Now, with that in mind, we also wouldn't blame anyone watching this for coming to the logical conclusion that as bad as it may be that Shishikedi would win what is basically a fraudulent election, that doesn't that at least ensure that the Congo has another peaceful election cycle and, well, that it stays relatively stable? And so that question, we say, well, fair enough. But it's also not that simple for two reasons. The risk of a military coup and a surge in violence in the eastern areas of the Congo that only seems to be getting worse. First, there's the threat of a military coup inside the DRC. Felix Shishikedi has not been shy about asserting his authority over the military, and he's done it largely by elevating young officers from both the country's elite Republican Guard and the rest of the armed forces. In October of last year, he replaced the head of the Congolese military with the former commander of the Republican Guard and announced a broad reform package. But between items in that reform package that granted the military greater flexibility and financial autonomy and Shishikedi's tendency to elevate officers who are more likely to be looking for something beyond their present station, the risk of a coup may seem relatively low. Put the Congo in context, though, and experts have been quick to point out fears of contagion from a tidal wave of coups in Africa over the last couple of years. Add to that Shishikedi's recent decision to end a stretch of military control over two Congolese provinces, and the serious recent uptick in violence that we're about to discuss, and the danger of a political coup begins to rise again. And then there's the violence in the DRC's eastern provinces, where an ongoing insurgency by the M23 rebel group, which we mentioned earlier, has kicked into high gear. In the last several months, some 7 million people have been displaced by the conflict, while over a million have been unable to secure the voting cards that would allow them to participate in the coming elections. M23 has perpetrated countless individual war crimes and crimes against humanity, a mainstay of modern Congolese conflict on all sides, including that of the government. But in the last week, M23 has made major strategic gains that suggest it may be ready for more than simply ruling over its current sphere of influence. On Friday, November the 24th, M23 seized the town of Mueso, a critical step in lining up an attack on the city of Goma. Population? Half a million people. 
If Goma and its surrounding province fall in the coming weeks, as could very well be the case, then President Shishikadi's decision to not allow voting in the areas where M23 operates will be the least of anyone's worries. In a nation that's already just barely hanging on, the loss of a whole province would almost certainly tip the balance towards greater violence. As always, Whatever happens in the Congo will have wide-reaching implications for the rest of the world. The Congo's reserves of copper, zinc, rare earth minerals, and most of all, cobalt, have made it into a very important partner for a number of big global players. Not because the nation offers much to a China or a Russia or a US, but because a stable Congo means stable access to Congolese mines. In recent years, that's drawn more weapons, more foreigners, and more money into the Congo's low-grade conflicts. But if the DRC continues cycling itself toward implosion, then international involvement in the region could broaden very suddenly and very soon. M23 is just one of over 120 rebellions and militias in the DRC. Uganda. Rwanda and China all maintain military influence in various directions, and if the Congo's tenuous balance really does collapse, then there's no telling what new regime may emerge in the aftermath. As the situation develops in the Congo, we'll be sure to provide regular updates, as we do for each of the topics that we've covered today, and the conflicts still raging, as well as all the conflicts still raging around the world. We'll see you next week.